For your sake, I said I will praise the moon, tell the color of the river, find new words for the agony and ecstasy of gulls. Because you are close, everything that men make, observe or plant, is close, is mine. The gulls slowly writhing, slowly singing, on the spears of wind, the iron gate above the river. The bridge holding between stone fingers, her cold, bright necklace of pearls. The branches of shore trees, like trembling charts of rivers, call the moon for an alloy to claim their sharp journeys out of the dark sky. But nothing in the sky responds. The branches only give a sound to miles of wind. With your body and your speaking, you have spoken for everything, robbed me of my strangerhood, made me one with the root and gull and stone. And because I sleep near to you, I cannot embrace or have my private love with them. You worry that I will leave you. I will not leave you. Only strangers travel. Owning everything, I have nowhere to go. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. This week's poem is Owning Everything by Leonard Cohen. This episode is a special one because it's dedicated to my gorgeous partner, Hannah. The music and poetry of Leonard Cohen has always been something we both adored and has a very special place in both our hearts. It's difficult to imagine Leonard Cohen as anything other than the cryptic, seemingly ethereal pop star of the 80s, or the esoteric gothic crooner of his later career. But in his early years, Leonard Cohen was simply a poet, and a rather excellent one at that. His first three collections let us compare mythologies, the spice box of the earth, and Flowers for Hitler came one after the other during the 50s and 60s. Each collection announced a work of labyrinthine and layered poetry that brimmed with symbolism, spirituality, and most importantly, at least for Cohn, love. I recently heard a wonderful quote from Irish poet Michael Longley. If poetry is a wheel, the hub for that wheel is love poetry. It would be fair to say that Leonard Cohn would have been a massive fan of wheels like that. Despite the fact that he was an incredibly prolific poet who wrote on a multitude of themes, love was always at their core. Within his body of work, it could take any form, from lust to pure romance or even religious transcendentalism. His handling of these grand themes is mythic in nature. That is not an exaggeration given the title of his debut collection. It's clear that the supernatural and magical nature of myth was one of the driving forces behind his early work. It is perhaps one of the reasons that Cohn became one of the defining literary figures of the early 60s, whose impact and legacy within the singer-songwriter movement of the time is unmistakable, if a little difficult to quantify. From those early poetic beginnings in Montreal, Cohn eventually turned to music for his poetry, frequently creating songs from his verse. His influence only reached greater heights when he came to the attention of record labels, who encouraged him to record his poet's songs. His particular brand of gloomy romance was monikered by some as the poet laureate of pessimism, the grocer of despair, the godfather of gloom, and perhaps the most memorable, the prince of bummers. This led to another reinvention, this time as the bard of experimental dirge pop. I think music critic Simon Lewson summed up Cohen's capacity as a living reincarnator best when he wrote, His life, which began in 1934 and ended on the eve of the 2016 US election, was a tribute to the human capacity for self-invention. In his 20s, Cohen was a poet and experimental novelist. A decade later, he was one of the world's most distinctive singer-songwriters, having recorded a suite of minimalist folk records with gnomic lyrics. By middle age, he had pioneered a new genre of synth-heavy spiritual pop, liturgical music for secular people, who still wanted to infuse their lives with the sense of the divine. 
Infusing the everyday with the sense of the divine is exactly what is taking place in this poem, owning everything. The divine force of this poem, however, is something altogether more flesh and blood. In this poem, as in many of Cohen's, the divine is a woman. Academic Simon Riches puts it succinctly when he writes, Cohen's relations with women, and indeed female beauty, engender a kind of religious experience, albeit a more hedonistic kind, which is to be accorded something approaching worship. In this poem, however, the religious experience has already taken place, and it has been transformative. The poem's opening stanza is a whirlwind of romantic mysticism, as Cohen writes, For your sake, I said I will praise the moon, tell the colour of the river, find new words for the agony and ecstasy of gulls. That opening line is a prayer, or the preface of an invocation. For your sake, the language of our speaker comes out almost like a spell, one used to commune with nature. The speaker turns to the river and the sound of seagulls as they swell and paints each one as almost a sentient thing. He anthropomorphizes a flock of birds and pins one colour to a river that must contain multitudes. And yet, that first line, for your sake, undermines all these acts. The speaker of the poem is not doing this for themselves. It is all in service to another. This does not devalue it though. These are beautiful acts of romance in themselves. And we get the sense as an audience that our speaker might be taking a stroll with the object of his affection. The mystery of why our speaker is performing all these mini acts of worship and indeed the transcendental nature of their relationship is made clearer in the next stanza. Because you are close, everything that men make, observe or plant is close, is mine. The gulls slowly writhing slowly singing on the spears of wind, the iron gate above the river, the bridge holding between stone fingers her cold, bright necklace of pearls. From the first line of this stanza, the intimacy of our speaker and his love is deepened. There, Leonard Cohen turns the confidence we all feel in the presence of the one we love into an all-encompassing conquering emotion. The world of man and nature bends to the speaker's will. He says that all these things are close and there is an almost unifying power in the love the speaker holds for his other, whomever they may be. As academic Desmond Pacey puts it, the fulfilled lover feels himself to be part of a universal harmony. The next set of images is an almost cinematic slow motion scene. The agony and ecstasy of the seagulls in the first stanza is transformed through the beauty of universal harmony into a slowly moving choir of singing. In some ways, this seems almost like a Leonard Cohen version of They Long To Be. There are hints of the famous lines, why do birds suddenly appear all over this poem? Though some might find that comparison insulting to Cohen's body of work. Cohn's flair for unique imagery reasserts itself in the phrase spears of wind, describing their movement and coldness all at once. Anthropomorphization, humanizing of the inanimate, returns again in the next few lines. A bridge is two hands reaching out for connection. A river holds its natural stones and gems like pearls. A woman touching their necklace. The world is alive while our speaker is with their desire. The bridge illustrates the intertwining of the natural and emotional landscapes. Everything is coming together. For me, all this living imagery only continues the strong themes of religious experience in the poem. Each one evokes the pagan notion of animism. The belief that objects, places and creatures all possess a distinct spiritual essence. This kind of deformalized or non-structured religion is key to understanding Cohen's particular form of the divine and spiritual. At times it borders on pure magic in his work. It functions as a kind of grab bag of beliefs, the hallmark of Cohen's, and a major contributing factor to how his poetry and lyrics resonated with listeners far and wide. 
As academic Harry Friedman put it, Cohen had an almost unique ability to draw on the best of every belief system he encountered. And as far as one can tell from his lyrics, he saw no conflict between any of them. Such harmonious melding is only reinforced by this poem. The speaker's living, enhanced world draws further breath in the next stanza. The branches of shore trees, like trembling charts of rivers, call the moon for an ally to claim their sharp journeys out of the dark sky. But nothing in the sky responds. The branches only give a sound to miles of wind. We move from a hint of spirituality to full-blown mysticism in this verse. The cold day and pointed imagery established by spears of wind earlier is given an expansion. From a purely imagery-based approach, branches reaching out to the moon seeking an ally in the night sky can be seen as a metaphor for the human longing for connection and understanding the vastness of existence. The branches' journey out of the dark sky and their failure to elicit a response from the celestial realm may reflect the often unanswered quest for meaning in life. Cohen's poetry frequently explores this theme, suggesting that while the universe may not offer clear answers, there is beauty and significance in the search itself. The final lines, describing branches giving sound to the wind, might symbolize the human capacity to find voice and expression, even in the absence of clear communication or understanding. The idea resonates with Cohen's broader philosophy, as captured in his interviews, and writings, where he suggests that life, in all its complexity, is worthy of celebration and contemplation, whether it brings joy or sorrow. In many ways, it is a perfect stand-in for love. We may not always have clear communication or understanding, but when we love something or someone, we find a way to express what we need to in actions, words, deeds or sometimes silence. Despite this hopeful positive interpretation, the image established in this third stanza is oddly desolate. It is a world that cannot contact or commune with divinity anymore. The reason for this severed connection is revealed in the final stanza. With your body and your speaking, you have spoken for everything. Robbed me of my strangerhood made me one with the root and gull and stone. And because I sleep so near to you, I cannot embrace or have my private love with them. You worry that I will leave you. I will not leave you. Only strangers travel. Owning everything, I have nowhere to go. If you've been paying attention, it's no surprise that the moon has lost its divine status. Because now, the speaker's lover is near, and they are the only form of divinity for them. You have spoken for everything. The speaker goes on to outline their own altered state in the presence of this new power. It is oddly violent in how it manifests. Robbed me of my strangerhood. It redeems itself, though, in the next lines. Made me one with root and gull and stone. The speaker goes on to explain the severing of his own connection with these things, and they give some explanation to what happened between the riverbank and the moon earlier in the poem. Connections are so often defined by the things we overcome to make them. In Cohen's poem, there is nothing left to overcome. The things that might necessitate coming together, and embrace as the speaker puts it, simply aren't there thanks to their love. The notion of opposition has been obliterated by harmony. For the first time, our divine figure is made mortal by being given an inner thought and concern. You worry that I will leave you. This wonderful trick by Cohn stops us, the reader, from becoming untethered from the poem. In stanzas filled with divine beings and metaphysical experiences, it could be easy to become lost, our interest doing the same. Yet in this one simple line, Cohen humanizes the experience, grounding us once more. Though the speaker's desire is celestial to them, they are still human and have a part in this relationship. The poet's words seem to echo 
this grounding sentiment with a promise. I will not leave you. Only strangers travel. Owning everything, I have nowhere to. They cannot and will not leave. They have found everything they've searched for in their desired figure. In doing so, they've become wonderfully vulnerable. Their love has removed barriers and defiance from their soul. They no longer feel a need or impulse to conquer or claim because they are in a state of owning everything, as they say. They are completely fulfilled. They recognize that in truly being in love, they have nowhere to go. To call Leonard Cohen a love poet would be an understatement. To claim that he was obsessed with romantic love would be misleading. Simon Riches offers another helpful insight when he writes, Given Cohen's poetic and transcendental approach, it is clear that Cohen would reject any classical theory account of love. In other words, he would reject the very idea that love could have a definable essence. The only thing that love is defined as in this poem is transformative. It is a poetic account on the ways in which love can foster in us a want to grow, change, develop, and ultimately accept ourselves and the world around us. Cohen's entire body of work is a testament to the wheel. He found a way to breathe love into everything in his life and respect every form of love he encountered. He never turned away from the erotic or lust but also never shied from the sentimental and silly moments of true love. His ability to ground and untether his audience to spirituality was a gift, and one that left everyone who encountered his work changed. This poem, Owning Everything, is a testament to change and how another can shape us when we let them. Love can bring us a harmony we didn't know we were missing. But what did you think of the poem? As always, this is my interpretation, and I'd love to hear yours. If you'd like to get in touch with me, there are a few ways to do so. You can reach me directly by email, wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. You can get in touch through the podcast website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com. I'm on Twitter, or X, at Words That Burn. I'm on Instagram at Words That Burn Podcast, where you can also find a link to my threads, and TikTok at Words That Burn 2. If you'd like to read the script for this week's podcast, complete with citations and sources, check the Substack link in the description. If you've enjoyed the episode or know someone who might, consider sending it to them directly or leaving me a review wherever you listen. Words That Burn is written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. Thank you for taking the time once again to listen to the podcast.